one hand and also inside the judiciary on the other. It is very important for our persons in struggle, for our comrades and friends to understand exactly what is happening so that you can take an enlightened step when these kinds of events take place. The battle between executive and judiciary is a long battle. Indira Gandhi tried to pack the judiciary with her people. The RSS and BJP will tell you hundred times that we are not the first group that is trying to pack the judiciary. Indira Gandhi did it. That is absolutely correct. But if Indira Gandhi has done it, it doesn't mean that the people of India will stand for any present government trying to do it also. But if we come to the present scenario, the real battle, the first battle started with the NJAC case, the National Judicial Appointment Committee case. As you know, India has a system which started some time back, judge-made law, where the Supreme Court said appointment of judges to the High Court and appointment of judges to the Supreme Court will be done by the senior most judges, called the collegium. Many criticisms made. We will touch on some of them briefly. But judges appoint judges. And anywhere in the world, if you go, you find this is very strange. How can judges appoint judges? But we have a system. And I would suggest that there are some elements of the system which are good as compared to a system where the executive appoints judges. If you ask me, you have two systems. One is the normal European system where the executive appoints judges. And you say to yourself, if this government is going to appoint judges, what is going to happen to the judiciary? And then you have a system where judges are appointing judges, where there are a lot of things going wrong there also. But if you compare the two, I would say, without any doubt, that I will continue with the present system and argue for the present system to be reformed. In the NJAC case, the, the executive, the central government, tried to introduce legislation to allow the government to start appointing or play a role in the appointment of judges. A very dangerous opening in the door. They tried to break the old system where government was kept out. Government is consulted. We intend to appoint these judges. Do you have any objection? Judges made, the, the government used to make objections. Some judges would not be taken. Consultation. But the Supreme Court said consultation does not mean agreement. The decision of the judges is final. That's the system. In the NJAC case, the executive came and said, this is the law we want to pass and we want to allow government to play a role in the appointment of judges. And I must say, to the credit of the judges of the Supreme Court, headed by a bench of Chief Justice Kehar, Four judges out of the five judges, without doubt, rejected the bill and said it was unconstitutional. It was unconstitutional. I want you to read particularly Mother Lokur's decision, brilliant decision. He said that the government is the major litigant and half of all the cases in the Supreme Court and the High Court involve the central government and the, and the state governments. You cannot have a litigant deciding, the major litigant deciding who the judges are to come up. That's a polite way of saying it. I would say that if you have a, a fascist party with a political orientation, we cannot have such fascist lawyers and judges being appointed to the High Court and Supreme so It's as simple as that. We can't have an ideology of this kind, which is fundamentally destructive of democracy, to come to your High Court and so and they rejected it. The most important thing was the language of the Attorney General. You have never seen any Attorney General, and that is the indication of the mind of government, address the court in a disrespectful manner like the Attorney General did. Very rude language, constantly pointing the finger at the court, constantly referring to the judges as you, and making fun of a particular judge who hardly wrote any judgments, but that was not true of the entire situation. Judges of the Supreme Court and High Court are very often very hard-working judges. They write an enormous amount of judgments. They work from morning to night. That's the other side of the story. There are some, of course, who are very slack and so on. 
the rudeness with which the court was approached gives you an intention, an idea that the executive sees the judiciary as an enemy. Clearly. Why is it an enemy? Environmentally destructive projects held up. Telecom scams set aside. Corrupt. Coal scams set aside. Corruption. Number of politicians sent behind bars. Prominent politicians sent behind bars. Recently in Goa, the mining leases of these mining companies that have looted India for decades set aside. Second lease of mining set aside. All kind of judgments of the court. In Manipur, Afspa, it doesn't matter, the Supreme Court said, it doesn't matter if you wear a uniform of a policeman or an army man. You kill a person in a fake encounter, you'll go to jail like in any ordinary criminal. And you'll be prosecuted in the criminal courts. Many of us have, you know, anger against the judiciary for having let us down. Many of us. Because the judiciary has let down the people of India again and again. But there's another side. And that's the side where certain parts of the judiciary stand up to the government and the government hates the judiciary for that and seeks to close down the judiciary. Chalameshwar, who's been in the papers, yes. Chalameshwar wrote the dissent. He said, I will uphold the act. You must understand. When you see these things in the papers, sometimes you are not able to understand fully the whole situation. Chalameshwar wrote a dissent. He said, I would set aside the financial system and I would allow this act to go through. Keep it in mind. So this is it. Collegiate system, good or bad, we don't have the time here to, to argue and discuss it. But just say this, that a collegiate system that is reformed, which becomes transparent, when a judge, when the judges choose a judge to know why he's chosen, what is his caste, what is his thinking on women's rights and so on, when that is transparent, you might have a better system to go by. Now, when they lost that battle, phase two of the battle started. And phase two of the battle was not appointment at all. If we don't get a right to appoint judges, we'll not appoint judges at all. And today, my dear friends, we have a catastrophic situation in the country where all the courts are at half level, quarter level judges. The NGT, the National Green Tribunal, has virtually closed down. There are benches of the tribunal that don't have judges. So cases are being transferred, say, from Pune to Delhi, and litigants have to come. There is a huge crisis in the judiciary, and the government is not appointing judges and virtually killing the judiciary. Then you have the appointment of judges, very clearly, very obviously linked to the central government. And there's a very prominent minister in the central government who was a very good lawyer when he was practicing before he became minister. And so the term normally used is these people are all friends of Mr. So and so. And you can see it, it's patent that you are linked to a particular person who is a prominent representative of the self, and that is why you get it. Now, Judge Lawyer's case. Turning point in the judiciary, like the emergency judgment, ATM Jabalpur. Emergency judgment, Supreme Court upheld the emergency. Lawyer's judgment, court says nothing wrong. With the death of Mr. Lawyer, nothing wrong. To my mind, one can be right, one can be wrong. But when there is such a wide perception among lawyers in Bombay who have practiced before justice, when there is such a wide perception that his death was not natural, his death happened because of unnatural causes, and when there are so many links between the case he was doing involving Amit Shah and his death, when there are so many links, all that the Supreme Court was asked for, not to hold A, B or C guilty, all that the court was asked, please appoint an independent investigation to find out the truth. And I must say, I'm personally, like all my colleagues, of course, I suppose like all of you, that we are very disappointed in the judgment of the court. And I think, although it is of smaller dimensions, it is as important as the ATM Jabalpur emergency case. Now, worse than that, was the language used by the court in criticizing the lawyers who argued the case. 
saying that their arguments amounted to contempt. And I don't know, maybe the judges may be right about you know, whether investigation should be done or not. I personally feel they're totally wrong. But to criticize the lawyers who have stood up and fought for that case and said you must have an independent investigation. Lawyers like, like Dave, lawyers like Prashant Bhushan who stood up and put their points of view fearlessly across to say that these arguments are perilously close to contempt of court. But we are not taking contempt action against them is I think the most unfortunate part of that judgment. And then you have the role of the Bar Council of India. It's a very different role now. So we lawyers and our institutions are playing a very important role in actually allowing this kind of, you know, anti-democratic tradition to take place, get roots. The Bar Council started attacking. The Bar Council started issuing notices of contempt. The Bar Council said, we move against you in, in, uh, to, to suspend you. Why should you not be? Can you imagine? And I want to say from this podium today that lawyers like Dave, lawyers like Prashant, who have spoken up fearlessly, lawyers like Indira Jaisi, who spoke up fearlessly, who didn't bother what the atmosphere was, are truly in the finest traditions of our power. Now, T.S. Thakur, former Chief Justice, made a statement a few days ago. He criticized the four judges. Now we have the third point. Judges speaking. So you must remember, the Supreme Court of India is not a single court. The American Supreme Court is a single court. The Irish Supreme Court is a single court. The European Court is a single court. It has chambers a single court. But the Indian Supreme Court is 13 courts sitting in benches of twos. And, and each bench, the judgment, is binding on the entire court. It speaks for the entire court. So you have 13 benches with 26 different judges of different thinking. And that's what makes the Indian Supreme Court so important. You may have a Chief Justice who is not progressive, but you may have many judges, many benches that are very progressive. And so when you look at the Indian judiciary, always remember, that there are those who will be wanting to be very cozy with the government, very close to the government, get benefits, get housing plus this. But there are many who will be fiercely independent no matter what. You must remember a judge gets, a judge of the High Court gets a salary of a lakh and a half, two lakhs, whatever. It's very low as compared to what lawyers earn. So some of them, some of the judges, some of them of course are different. But some of the judges are very hardworking, very dedicated, and take their lives as a mission. And I must say, those four judges who spoke up, who did an extraordinary thing. Can you imagine getting up from your court at 11 o'clock? You start at 10.30, nobody understands what's happening. 11, 11.30, you get up from your court. You come out onto the lawn. You sit in front of national television. And you say, we don't agree with what the Honorable Chief Justice said. Can you imagine? It was a dedicated and a very bold decision to take. And, and when he asked me, what do you say, Mr. Gonsalves? I said a simple thing, which I think all of you will say. We applaud these four judges for standing up and speaking. They, they were subjected to terrific criticism. This media, which has turned out to be a puppet of some section, this video also of ours has become very, very, very strange. So they were subjected to terrific pressure. There were judges also who subjected them to pressure, or making all kinds of criticism. But if you make an objective assessment, the political times are such, we cannot have half measures. And we are proud that judges stand up and speak, and we understand when we approach the judiciary, that we understand there are two parts a bad part and a good part. And we try and work with the good part while criticizing the bad part. Now, I want to go to my last point. What is the large agenda? What is the large Hindutva agenda in the judiciary? There are two judgments which stand in the way of Hindutva. S.R. Bhumai's case is one. 
The state has no religion. Believe this in today's times. The state has no religion. The state stands aloof from religion. The state is independent of religion. Three glorious phrases. In India, even among progressive sections, there's a wrong understanding of Indian secularism. We say there's a difference between Western secularism and Eastern secularism. Western secularism doesn't allow anything inside a public premise. You go to Europe, you can't have any religious sign anywhere. You wear the cross, you wear it discreetly inside. You can't have pictures of gods. Nowhere. You will remember the Ten Commandments he is putting up. Ten Commandments, which is a Christian Ten Commandments outside the Supreme Court in some state. Total separation of the state from religion. People say, and I've heard it said very often, that in India we don't have, our notion is different. Our notion is the state gets involved with all religions equally. That's nonsense. That's totally nonsense. So we promote you, we promote you, we come to your temple, we come to your mosque, we come here, we... It's totally wrong. And we must look at it a little closely. The state has no religion. The state stands independent of religion. The state stands aloof from religion. And ask yourself, if you have the inauguration of a public sector plant, can you do the lighting of a lamp? Maybe, maybe not. Can you do the breaking of a nadir? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you must have secular practices when you do this. Can a minister, when he goes in his garden with his hundred security people, go to a particular religious place with his security of the state? Or must he leave it all behind and take his private car and take his private uh, security and go for his religious practices? Huge ramifications. Right across the country you'll see pictures. I don't want to say what, but you know you have pictures all over the place. And in the Kendriya schools, that case has gone to the Supreme Court just now. You start with the OM, you start with certain, and all the students and professors are required to start with that prayer. That has gone to the Supreme Court now, filed by an atheist on behalf of this child, saying, I don't want, I've always been an atheist, my family are atheists, you cannot have this kind of prayer, please change it and make it compatible with secular values. And I would request all of you who work in education and other fields, try and look at these things which we accept, which we take for granted, and see whether it's constitutional or unconstitutional. I remember Justice Chief Justice Sabarwal. Chief Justice Sabarwal, many years ago, the man is now dead, he was a good judge. But I remember this picture of him when Modi was Chief Minister in Gujarat. He sat on the ground. He started doing pujas, Modi was sitting, Sabarwal was sitting, the lights were being there. And it was a national law institute, I think it was a national law college in, in Gujarat. And the pictures had this beautiful thing and everybody said this is perfectly alright for the chief justice who is supposed to uphold constitutional values to sit with the chief minister and do this kind of thing. Yeah, I'm finishing now sir. Last. First judgment is SR Bomai. SR Bomai, students stand in their way. And we must use this. The next, K. Shivananda Bharati. K. Shivananda Bharati, again a big bench of the court. And this is the reason why the state must get appointed to the Supreme Court judges of its color. You know what color? Judges of its color. K. Shivananda Bharati, 13 judges. Secularism is part of the basic structure of the constitution of India. It cannot be amended. Got it? Cannot be amended means it goes beyond popular mandate. The whole country may vote saying we want a particular rashtra. The whole country may say we don't want democracy, we don't want, like we have Islam. If some country is Islamic, why cannot we be a Hindu rashtra? It's secular, it cannot be amended, Keshav Nandabharati. And you remember there was discussion some time back where the law minister said, I want to remove from the constitution secularism and socialism. 
Then there was a clamor and he calmed down. But this calming down was an enemy making a strategic retreat to fight when he's on stronger ground. And when will he be on stronger ground? When he can get particular judges filling the Supreme Court so that a particular Chief Justice can make a larger bench, set aside Keshav and the Bharati, saying nothing to it. You can have a popular mandate and amend any part of the Constitution and you can change your Constitution from secular to liberal. Bangladesh, I want, I'll end with this one very important. Even a country like Bangladesh, which was once upon a time by a constitution bench decision declared to be an Islamic state. The constitution had some ambiguities. But the judges of the court recently sat, I think two years ago, three years ago, and declared that even though Islam is the official religion of Bangladesh, the constitution is secular and the state is secular. <laughs>